basically saying, listen, you know, two approaches, either one approach, there aren't any iniquities, there aren't any transgressions, and therefore God doesn't see them. Or a second approach that we saw, which was that, yes, indeed, God does, we do have iniquities, we do have transgressions, but God, out of his love for us, chooses to not pay attention to those iniquities, not pay attention to those transgressions. So that's what we saw. And in fact, that was Rashi's interpretation. We saw, we saw um, uh, a Nitziv last week who said that the reason for that is because um, when, it, when a Jewish person sins, that it doesn't taint that neshama, meaning that, that a person sins leteavo, and a person sins because of passion or because of appetite, not, not because the person is intrinsically, uh, you know, intrinsically bad. And as a result of that, Hashem is able to, to, to not pay attention to our transgressions and not, and not be overly, fo not be focused on our shortcomings. Um, the Rashbam, one of the commentaries, supports this position. And he supports this position by making reference to an interesting pasuk in Eov. An interesting pasuk in, in Sefer Eov, the book of Job. Um, the pasuk says, and I'll, I'll give it a context in a moment. The pasuk says, Ki hu yada, that he knows, meaning God knows, misay shav, God knows uh, people's nature, Vayar Oven, and he when he sees iniquity, when he sees something wrong, Velo Yisbonain, he shouldn't he shouldn't pay attention to it. Now, in order to understand this statement and how the Rashbam uses it as a um, as a proof for this idea, because he's certainly not using it from a Pshat perspective, we need to understand the backstory a little bit. So what is the backstory of Sefer Eov? So let me share this with you. Or let me try to share this with you. Okay. So we all know what happened. We all, we all know what happens with Eov and, uh, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You know, the Satan comes and the Satan says to uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, you know, the reason that Eov is such a righteous guy is because nothing's ever happened to him. You know, give me a few minutes with him. In other words, let me let me cause him pain. Let me cause him anguish. Let me let me make him miserable. Let me cause him loss. And then you'll see he's not such a tzaddik. Um, and that was the deal that Hashem and this and the Satan struck up. It's obviously questionable for us. But you know how 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 do we explain this whole Eov story? This whole Eov situation. But nevertheless, it is something that, um, you know, we all, we all understand what Eov is about. So um, I, can you see the puzzle clearly on your screen? I'll make it, I'll make it a little bit bigger. Okay, so this is, this is the puzzle um, of Eov's friends coming to visit him. This is a major interplay in, in the book. In the in Sefer Eov, the major interplay is where Eov is now distressed that all of these things have happened to him, and he's trying to explain or understand why, basically, these terrible things have happened to to a good person. Um, this is a, it's an age old uh, question. Um, it's, a, it's actually discussed among religious philosophers who are, who are not Jewish, uh, and it's called the problem of evil. And the problem of evil essentially says that if we assume that God is God, what does it mean if we assume that God is God? So if we assume that God is uh, omnipotent, what does omnipotent mean? You know what? Just just unmute yourselves. <laughs> it's much better with you guys unmuted, right? Omnipotent means all powerful, right? If we say that God is all powerful, meaning that God is the most powerful force that exists, and God is omniscient, what is omniscient? All knowing. 
all knowing that God, there's nothing that God doesn't know. There is no power that God doesn't have, and there's no knowledge that God doesn't have, and he's omnibenevolent. What does that mean? All good. All good. Means that God is all good, right? It, and, and these, by the way, these three principles are fundamental in our belief in God, because if we indeed believe that, if we believe in a God, so we're believing in a God who is all of these things. He is the most powerful force in existence. He, is a for, he, he knows everything because he created everything and he knows everything. And he is omnibenevolent, meaning that he is all good. Because if we say that God was not all good, that would imply that there is something else that is all good. And that, that something else would be on a higher level than God. So if we ascribe these three traits to God, so then the question is, where does bad come from? And the way the problem of evil is understood by the philosophers is sort of like, if God is willing to prevent evil, but not able to present, prevent it, then he's not omnipotent. If he's able to prevent it, but not willing to prevent it, then he's not um, opti-benevolent, right? Um, uh, omni-benevolent. And if he's willing to prevent it, and he's capable of preventing it, so then there shouldn't be any evil. And if there is evil, then where's God? In, in other words, that, that's the dilemma that religious philosophers have faced for centuries, essentially from the beginning of a belief in monotheism. If you don't believe in monotheism, if you don't believe in one God, so this, the problem of evil in the world is relatively easy to deal with. Because if you believe in two gods, let's say a, a dualism or a Zoroastrianism, you believe in two gods or you believe in multiple gods, so no one god is more powerful than the next. And they're, you know, this god's responsible for evil and this god's responsible for this. So, and they fight with each other. So this is only an issue for those religions that are monotheistic religions. And... Once we're a monotheistic religion and we believe in a divine being, an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good divine being, so then it's a real fundamental question where evil comes from. So Eov is contemplating where this evil is coming from. And he's sitting and he's literally licking his wounds. And what happens? So the book of Job tells us, Vayishmu'u shaloshes Re'e uh, Re Eov, right? Eov's uh, three friends hear about what's going on, and they heard, right? Eskol ha-ra'ah ha-zos alav, all of these terrible things that happened to Eov. And you know what all these terrible things that happened to Eov were. His, his, he lost his entire family. He lost, he lost all of his wealth. He became physically afflicted. And all of these terrible things, the friends have heard all of these terrible things. Vayavo ish mimikomo, and each of them make a journey to Eov. There were three of them. I'm sure you know these names: Eliphaz Hatemani, Ubildad Hashuchi, Vitzofar, Vitzofer Hanaamati. The, the descriptions are places where they come, where they came from. Eliphaz came from Teman, Bildad came from Shuach, Tzofer came from Naama. Vayivadu yachtav lavo lanudlo ulenachamo. That what happened? They gathered together, and they gathered together in order to ultimately come and comfort Eov. So. This, right, you all know this story. Everybody knows the story of Eov. And what does this have to do with Bilam? Where we're going to come to. But that's the, the, that's the opening scene. What's the next scene? So the next scene is as follows. Let's see if I can get it for you. Okay. 
Okay, so the next scene is, the Torah tells us, Vayisu es, uh, the Sefer Yov tells us, Vayisu es enehem me rachok, that they're, they're now traveling to visit Eov, and they lift up their eyes, meaning they look and they see him from a distance, Velohi kiruhu, and they didn't recognize him. Because of all of these terrible things that have happened, you know, when terrible things happen to someone, it takes a physical toll. And they didn't recognize Eov. Vayisu kolam, and they raise their voices, Vayivku, and they cried. They cried because of the anguish of their friend. Vayikru'u ish mi'ilo, and each one tore their, their cloak, their garment, right? Tearing is a sign of mourning. They were mourning over what happened with Eov. Vayizruku afar al rashehem hashamayma. What did they do? And they, they threw dirt, threw dust or threw dirt on their heads. Okay, so what is this? So this is the idea that um, the friends have taken in this first scene. They've come to be Menachem him, and they're, they're now overwhelmed by what they see. That's scene number two. What is scene number three? So let me share that with you now. Scene number three is, Vayeshivu ito la'aretz shivas yamim v'shivas lelos. What happened? They sat with Eov on the ground, because Eov was sitting on the ground. The mourner sits on the ground or on a low, on a low chair, a low stool, a low bench. Um, uh, shivas yamim v'shivas lelos, seven days and seven nights. V'ein dover a love davar, and nobody said a word to him. Ki ra'u ki gadol ha'keiv ma'od. Why? Why did nobody say a word to him? Nobody spoke to him because they saw how painful everything was for Eov, and they simply sat with him. And what's amazing is that the Medrash records. It's not that they simply sat with him. When he stood up, they stood up. When he sat down, they sat down. When he ate, they ate. When, when he drank, they drank. Meaning that their presence, they were looking to comfort Eov just from their presence. Which is an important part of being Menachem and Ovel. Comforting an Ovel is just to be there. Just the, your presence there. Without saying anything, your presence there can bring about comfort. And why didn't they say anything? Why didn't anyone speak? So now we go to the next scene. Nobody spoke until we see Acharei Chain Patach Iov es Pihu Vayikalel es Yomo. That after a week, after seven days and seven nights of his friends just sitting there, and the assumption is no conversation between them, by patach Eov espihu, Eov began to speak. So everything up until now is in the second parak, and the third parak talks about Eov and all of his complaints, why all of these things, he doesn't understand how God works, he doesn't understand why this should be, he didn't do anything wrong, why is all of this happening to him, he's cursing the day of his birth, and then finally in Perek 4, Perek chapter 4, Perek Dalid, we see, Vayan Eliphaz HaTemani Vayomer, that Eliphaz begins to speak, and he says, and what happens now, is there is literally a, uh, uh, what's, is it a monologue? I think that's the word I'm looking for. Each of these three friends present a monologue to Eov as to their understanding of why he is suffering. Why all of this is happening to him. And by the way, this, this whole Sefer Eov, this whole book, you know, sort of prevents, uh, presents us with, you know, the classical explanations as to why bad things happen to good people. 
and whether or not in the end we accept them or we don't accept them, um, obviously, I mean, I'll, I'll give you, the, uh, I'll let you in on the end of the book. God says none of them are right, you know, that, that there's something else going on here. But these are, the, these are the commonly accepted explanations for why bad things happen to good people. We're interested particularly in that which so far Hanami, so far Hanami said. Uh, Naamati said, and what did he say to Eov? So he said to Eov that, in other words, Eov is complaining and, and Eov is saying, you know, I can't believe all these terrible things have happened to me. And Eliphaz says one, gives one explanation and Bildad gives another explanation. And now it's Sofer's turn. And what does Sofer say? Sofer says, Eov, the reason that these terrible things are happening to you is not because bad things happen to good people. It's because bad things happen to bad people. And Eov, you must have done something that caused God to punish you. If something bad happens to you, says Sofer, if something bad happens to you, it is because you are deserving of that bad. We don't believe in a God who causes bad things to happen to good people. And by the way, this is just two of the classical approaches. Either you say, when you say, how do bad things happen to good people? There are two, two approaches. One approach is the bad things are not really bad things. We just don't understand them. And the other approach is the good person is not really a good person. He's deserving of this punishment. And therefore, Sofer says to Eov, because, I mean, Eov has lived this, you know, Gold Coast life up until now, right? Eov has had everything that he's wanted. He's been extraordinarily successful. He's had a great family. And now all of it taken away, and Eov is like, what's going on? So Sofer says to Eov that God knows human nature. And Vayar Oven Velo Yisbonain, is it possible, he asks it as a rhetorical question, is it possible that God will see something, some kind of transgression in a person, Velo Yisbonain, and he won't pay attention to it? Basically, what so far is saying is that, you know, God allows there to be evil in this world, but, all, you know, in other words, God allows a person to, to do things that are wrong, but the ledger is still being kept. The tab is still running up. I should say the meter is still running, right? That that's what happens. And, and ultimately, God is going to deal with the transgressions of this person. That's what Sofer says. And his words, Vayar Oven Velo Yisbonain, is what the Rashbam uses to, to tell us that God sees iniquity. Velo Yisbonain, he doesn't pay attention to it. Now, Sofer says it as a rhetorical question to you. He's saying, do you think that God sees iniquity and just ignores it? Obviously not. God obviously ultimately pays the person back for his transgressions. But the Rashbam takes it not in its rhetorical way. The, Ramban, the, the Rashbam takes it as a statement. Vayar Aven, God sees iniquities. Velo he doesn't pay attention to it. And therefore, that's what Bilam is saying to, to Balak here. He's saying, you know, th these Jews have a very special relationship with their God. Right? And lo, he beat Oven be Yaakov. Right? He doesn't, God just ignores their transgressions. They, they transgress, but lo, he beat Oven be Yaakov. So that's where the Rashbam is taking it from. And he's taking it from the statement of Tsofer as he comes to console his friend Eov. Now, again, I don't know how much consolation that is. I mean, imagine you're sitting there wondering why all these terrible things have happened to you. And along comes one of your friends and said, you know why all these terrible things have happened to you? Because you deserve it, right? Because you deserve it. Now, maybe that philosophically makes you whole, but I don't know that there's a lot of comfort in hearing something like that. But put that, put that to the side. 
I wanted to I wanted to set the stage of Eov so that you would understand where it so far is coming so far is coming from and where the rush bomb picks this up from. But now I want to go back to Eov. Because I want to go back to Eov because within Eov there is a very important lesson to be learned. And what is that lesson? So I'm going to bring it to you. I'm going to share it with you now. Let's see if I can do that. Okay, uh, nope, not there. We'll, we'll get back to that in a second. What is the very important lesson which, um, which is shared? So there's actually a Gemara that appears in Maseches Moed Katan. And the Gemara says, I'm a Rebbe Yochanan in the name of Rebbe Yochanan. Ein menachamin rishain lomar davar. People who come to comfort are not allowed to say anything until the Avel begins to speak. So you all know that halacha, right? It's a halacha, it's brought down in the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch says the same thing, that you're not, if you go to be Menachem Avel, you go to comfort someone, you're not supposed to say anything until that Avel, until that person says something to you. Uh, un unfortunately, maybe that ship has sailed. I don't know, um, but it's it's nevertheless it's a halacha, and it, there's a good reason there, because you know sometimes, and this perhaps goes to a more you know to a discussion of whether or not uh, we need to uh, remind people of the etiquette of shiva calls. Unfortunately, people think shiva calls are about themselves, and since they're uncomfortable sitting there not talking, because we're all uncomfortable not talking. Um, they talk. But if, if the focus of the Shiva call is not on me who's coming to comfort, but rather on the Avel who I'm coming to comfort, so Avelim don't always want to talk. You know, sometimes they just want to sit there. Sometimes they're in such pain that they can't talk. And they get comfort just from knowing that you're there, just from your physical presence that you're there. You know, we have all these apocryphal stories of Gedolim, who came to make a shiva call and they sat for an hour. You know, they came in, they sat down for an hour. They didn't say a word. The Abel didn't say a word. They got up, they said, Hamakom Yenachem, and they left. Right? And that is absolutely the appropriate halachic way to do it. Now, if you're an Abel, somebody says to you, you know, people aren't allowed to say something until you say something to them. So, you know, you should say something to them. I guess that's to deal with the ship that has sailed already. But... But the essence of the halacha is that you're not supposed to speak until the Avel speaks. Because um, if you're coming to comfort, you want to know that the Avel will be comforted by talking and not simply comforted by sitting. That's an interesting halacha, an important halacha, important etiquette, shiva etiquette. There's actually another interesting shiva etiquette that, um, that actually would connect, connected to... Parshas Chayi Sara, and I think, I think, I don't know, Beverly, were you the one who said the ship has sailed? Who said the ship has sailed? I don't remember. Okay, whoever, whoever said the ship has sailed, um, so that might very well be Rosie. So, so Rosie, this other ship has sailed as well, and what is that ship? So we know when Avraham, Vayavo Avraham, Lispod Lissara Veliv Kosa. That Avram came to eulogize Sarah and to cry for her. And we know that mourning is composed of both crying and eulogizing, right? Not eulogizing in the sense that you get up in front of people and give a hespit. But, you know, when you're mourning, you're talking about the person. And that talking about the person is considered hespit. Not, not the classical definition of hespit, but that's considered hespit. And that's what we do during Shiva. We cry and we are maspit. And that's what Avram Avinu did, is he was mourning Sarah. He cried and he was maspit. But if you look at the word of Elif Kosa, you'll notice that the chaf is smaller. Right? It, it's called a chaf ziiri. It's smaller. And whenever there's a letter which is bigger or smaller than the rest of the letters, it's there to bring our attention to it. So how do the rabbis interpret Elif Kosa, the small chaf? 
So I'll share with you two explanations, one that's relevant to what we're discussing and one that's just, I think, a, a great explanation. Uh, the one that's relevant to what we're discussing is this idea that Avraham only cried a little bit, meaning that the word cha, that the chaf, the small letter chaf in the word v'liv kosa, means that Avraham cried a little bit. He eulogized her more, but he only cried a little bit. So from here, we understand that in mourning, there's crying. The first part is crying, and then there is, and then there's hesped. And the classical understanding, the classical understanding is three days of crying and four days of hesped. Because that's human nature. You have to first come to grapple to try to accept the loss. So three days of crying and then four days of hesped. So there was shiva etiquette at one time. It's actually brought down the halacha that you should not go to make a shiva call for the first three days. Because during those first three days, people are not looking to, to, to be comforted because they haven't, they haven't themselves wrapped their head around it. So they're not, you can't comfort a person you know, who's, who's uh, in the midst of this intense mourning. We, we have a terrible minhag America here. Right? The, the terrible minhag America is that at a funeral, uh, we make these avelim sit in a room and we encourage people to come into the room and to speak to them. It's horrific. Why? Because the Gemara tells us that you can't comfort someone at the time when the person who passed away is right there, right in front of him, right? It's, it's raw, it's painful, it's soon, too soon. You can't comfort a person like that. And so, and so this idea of coming in, you know, walking through a room and muttering something like, I'm sorry, which is, what are you going to say, right? And say, I'm sorry for your loss, you know, I'm thinking about you. And the, mourn, and the person who's mourning has to respond to you and say, thank you for coming, I appreciate it, you know, how's the kid, whatever it is, right? It's all, it's all very unnatural. Unfortunately, funeral homes in America have made it natural, but it's all very unnatural. If you go to funeral homes in, in, in Barrow Park, um, so you go to funeral homes in Barrow Park, uh, you know, generally it doesn't happen. You come to a levaya, what do you do? You go into the chapel and you sit in the chapel and the, the avelim come in and then you're menachem them at the end, right? As, as they're walking along with the hearse. That's when you're menachem them, right? So, so that's what happens. So that's, that's one good thing about Brooklyn. I mean, there are, there are lots of other not such great things about Brooklyn. That's one good thing. I'll, I'll, share, with you, I'll, I'll share with you something that my, um, one of my children shared with me, uh, that he had a friend on the Upper West Side who was working in Brooklyn and needed, you know, he, he needed to dive in Mincha. So he decided he would go into one of the shuls in Brooklyn. So he went into one of the shuls in Brooklyn and he was wearing a mask because he's from the Upper West Side. So everybody on the Upper West Side, as Sue knows, always does the right thing, right? So he, so he was wearing a mask and he goes into this minion in Brooklyn and there's nobody wearing a mask, nobody, except for one fellow who's standing in the back of the room wearing a mask. So this guy from the Upper West Side goes and stands near that fellow and Davin's near that fellow. And at the end of davening, he goes over to the fellow and he says to him, listen, I just want to thank you, you know, for wearing a mask. You made me feel more comfortable. At which point the fellow turns to him and said, are you COVID positive also? So, you know, it's, it, and it, unfortunately and sadly, as much as we might say, it's a true story. It's a true story. So, uh, you know, if we wonder why things are, are, you know, why this, why things are the way they are, that's a shtickle of an answer. But at least when it comes to Levias, they have it right, right? At least when it comes to Levias, you know, you, you don't, you don't really comfort the family. Although I've been to a few in Brooklyn where that's starting to creep in. You, you don't comfort someone at this point. Within the first three days of Shiva, the halacha says you don't go to make a Shiva call. But Rose, as Rosie will tell us, that, that ship has sailed also because... Now, if you don't, you know, it's like, I got to go within the first, it, it, it changed from, 
you know, I shouldn't go during the first three days to I have to go during the first three days. Because if I don't go during the first three days, people are going to think I don't care. Where have you been? How come you haven't come? Uh, everybody else came. How come you didn't come? So, so yes, that ship has sailed also. But that's, but that's, that's Shiva etiquette. That's the Veliv Kosa, the small chap. But I'll share a very interesting, uh, another idea with you. And we're completely off the topic right now, but at least we know we're still in class. And what is that? That if you take out the chaf from the word veliv kosa, what do you have? Right? Veliv kosa was bays, chaf, tough, hey. If you take out the chaf, you're left with bays, saf, hey, which spells besa. Right? Besa. When Avraham what what was Avraham mourning about? Because Avraham was mourning about what happened to his house now that Sarah's gone. He, right when the Rashi, the, the famous Medrash Rashi, the Rashi quote says, as long as Sarah was alive, there was a cloud that was connected, right? A cloud that hovered over Sarah's tent. You know, when I was a when I was a kid growing up, I used to read um I shouldn't tell you all of this. I don't know. I used to read the comics in the newspaper. So there was a, anybody remember little Abner? Five. Right? right? Sure. So, so there, he always used to walk around with this cloud right over his head, which was not a good sign. That's not the cloud I'm talking about, right? The cloud over Sarah's tent was an indication of a Kaddish Baruch Hu's Shechina being present in her house, right? It was, it was the cloud that led B'nai Yisrael through the Midbar. The cloud that was Sarah's tent, that's representative of the Shechina. There was a ner daluk me erev Shabbos la erev Shabbos. There was a candle that was burning from one from one erev Shabbos to another erev Shabbos. What does that mean? So we talk about ner mitzvah that Sarah was constantly involved with mitzvos. There was a bracha mitzuya beisa. There was a blessing that was found in the dough. Sarah was always hospitable. She always had her house open, and and if she didn't have prepared enough food, magically it it turned into enough food. And when Sarah died, these three things disappeared from Avram Avinu's house. So even though we think of Avram, he's the big Baal Chesed, he's the big uh, Hachnasas Orchim guy. You know, he wears a shirt that says, I am Machnis Oreach. But it was really Sarah that it came from. And Avram realized that now that Sarah was gone and these things disappeared, he came and he mourned, right? Vayavo Avram, Lispod Lissara Ulebesa and to her house that has changed. And that's, a, and that's an interesting insight into human nature. And that is that we often don't fully appreciate people when we have them. And only when we no longer have them and, and we, we realize that loss and we see what's missing from our lives, um, you know, do we, do we understand just, just how valuable they were, just how much they gave us. In fact, Rav Soloveitch, you're going to... Sure, of course. Uh, is EO, what we learned there, supposed to be the paradigm of Shiva calls? So, um, <clears throat> according, according to the Gemara in Maseches Katon, Fern, yes. Certain elements of it. I, I wouldn't suggest that you go into a Shiva house and say to the person, gee, you know why he suffered so much? He must have been a bad guy. I, the content, I, I, but the form I'm asking. The form of it, yes, Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know that that I don't know that that component is a component that is learned out lahalacha from from Eovina. The only component which is learned out lahalacha is the one that we've discussed, which is that an Abel is not supposed to talk until that and that that menachamin, right? A person who's coming to be menachem should not talk until the Abel speaks first, and that's encoded in the Shulchan Aruch, right? The Shulchan Aruch writes that we don't have any other shiva etiquette that we learn from this story, except for that one, okay? They, they signed up for the same session. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that terrible that we think that way? That we think that way? I, uh, I, I saw this, Ellen and I, Ellen and I saw this movie last night. Gosh, I don't remember the name of it. Um, 
Uh, it's a it's a Netflix movie with Sophia Loren. Oh yeah. Right and. Uh, I saw it last night too. Right. So Ellen and I just we we watched it last night. One of the one of the benefits of COVID, right? That we watched it last night. And um, why was I talking about it? Uh, why did I just signing up? For oh Netflix? yes, right. So so um, I'm watching the movie and people are people are interacting with each other without masks. And they're all close to each other. And I'm like, wait, something's wrong. You know, it's like, it's like our whole, our whole perspective has changed. Our whole world perspective has changed. And our whole culture. And I am waiting for that first Shabbos when we can be back in shul, sitting next to each other with masks, without masks. And I think it's going to be really weird. And I imagine we'll get used to it, but I think it's going to, you know, because we've we've all gotten a little bit into this culture. Okay, so uh, so right, so back to our topic. So um, so we we learned this from Eov, and and uh, and basically we've we've we're circling back now. We've basically stated that uh, Hashem, even if there are transgressions among the Jewish people, Hashem doesn't pay attention to them. But if you look carefully at your Pasuk, you'll notice that there are two phrases that seem to say the same thing, right? Lo he beat oven be Yaakov, velo ra'a amal be Yisrael. So they're, they're both basically saying the same thing, namely that, that um, God doesn't see the transgressions among the Jewish people, but there are two different expressions for seeing. There are two different expressions for transgressions. And there are two different expressions for the Jewish people. And, you know, obviously, you know, Bilam is waxing poetic here. Um, but the Meforshim see in this, in this idea a, a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a deeper interpretation. So I'll share that with you now. Okay. So the Malbim says that these, these words for seeing, right? Lo he beat Aven Biyako, Velo Ra'a Amal Bi Yisrael, they have different meanings. What does ra'a mean? Ra'a means to look, to see something, right? You, you look outside your window, you see the garbage truck going by, right? You know, you look, uh, you look at your fireplace, you see a fire going on, whatever it is, ra'a, you just, you look, you look at it. He beat means something else, says the Malbim. He beat means to look at something with a deeper perception, right? In other words, you're not just looking, but you're contemplating, you're perceiving something. That's what he beat means. Where does the Malbim get this from? So something that we learned already, we learned about the Nachash HaNechoshes, the copper or brass snake that Moshe Rabbeinu was commanded by Hashem to set up in order to counteract the punishment of the fiery serpents. And if a person had been bitten by one of the fiery serpents, I think, I hope you remember this, what was he supposed to do? He was supposed to look at this nachash ha-nechoshes and he would be healed. So the, you have the pasuk on, in front of you on the screen. Vayas Moshe not nechash nechoshes. Moshe made this copper or brass serpent. Vayasimehu al hanes. And he put it on a pole. Vayayim nashach ha-nachash es Ish, and if the serpent, the fiery serpents, bit a person, vihi beat el nechasha nechoshes vachai. What would he do? When he looked at the nechasha nechoshes, he would live. He would be healed. What does that mean when he looked at the nechasha nechoshes, he would be healed? Is the assumption that the nechasha nechoshes was some kind of magical thing? No. The idea is when he looked up at this nechasha nechoshes, that were, or this Nachash HaNechoshes, which was on this pole, the very act of looking up caused him to contemplate God and to contemplate that he needed to do tshuva. And when that change happened, so, okay, so, so then he was healed. The same thing, think back to Moshe and Yehoshua and Alek 
uh, after uh, B'nai Yisrael left Mitzrayim, what happened? So after B'nai Yisrael left Mitzrayim and you had this whole battle against the Malek, Moshe was sitting on the top of the, of the mountain and he lifted up his hands and B'nai Yisrael were victorious. What does it mean he lifted up his hands and B'nai Yisrael were victorious? Magic in his hands? No, when he lifted up his hands, B'nai Yisrael contemplated Hashem. They sort of like he pointed them towards Hashem. So that's the idea. That's the idea, says the Mabim, of what Vihibit is. Hibit means to look deeper into something. I never uh, realized the word Amal is in Amalek until this minute. Isn't that strange? Uh, interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, so that's, that's the first distinction that the Mabim presents. Then he presents a second distinction. And what is the second distinction? Says the Malbim. Um, Avon uh, refers to a bad deed. And Almal says the, says the Malbim refers to bad character traits. In other words, you know, an Avon is a bad deed. A person does something bad. That's an Avon. An amel is where a person does something bad, but with, but the, you know, when you look inside that person, you see that person has bad character traits as well. So it's interesting, you know, the, the amalek fits very nicely with this, right? So what's the comparison between it? So based, so based on, sorry for the noise in the background here, based on what the, uh, what the Malbim says, when it comes to looking at an avon, when it comes to a bad deed, which is visible, right? A deed is visible to everybody. So when it comes to looking at a bad deed or seeing a bad deed, the word which should be used is ra'a because it's right in front of you. It's right there. You don't have to contemplate it. It's right there, right? So ra'a and avon should go together. And accordingly, he beat and, um, and Amel should go together, right? Because if Amel refers to bad character traits, you can't see bad character traits, right? What do you have to do? You have to, you have to really think about a person. You have to think about a situation. You have to contemplate it. Then, then you see the bad character traits. So, so Ra'a should line up with Aven and he beat should line up with Amel. With, what's the problem? That's not what our Pasuk says. What does our Pasuk say? Our Pasuk says just the opposite, right? Our Pasuk says, Lo he beat oven be Yaakov, velo ra'a amal be Yisrael. So according to the Malbim, these things are switched around. And what's the reason that they're switched around? says the Malbim that they're switched around in order to teach us that when it comes to Amal, when it comes to bad character traits, which require Hibit, which require contemplation, that's not how a Kaddish Baruch Hu approaches them. Kaddish Baruch Hu only approaches them with Ra'a, meaning he only, you know, he only sees the deed. He doesn't, he's not contemplating the deeper elements of it. When it comes to Avon, which is a bad deed, so that's where a Kaddish Baruch Hu uses Hibit. Why? Because he looks inside, right? If, if he were to look inside, there wouldn't, be any, uh, there wouldn't be any bad character traits associated with it. So the Mabim says that, yes, these are two different expressions. And they are both contributing to our understanding that a Kaddish Baruch Hu chooses, when, he comes, when, it, when it comes to dealing with us, HaKadosh Baruch Hu chooses to see things different. In other words, he focuses on things differently. When it comes to an oven, when it comes to a transgression, which the proper use, the proper verb would be he beat, lo he beat. He doesn't look at it that way. And when it comes to an amal, I'm sorry, when it comes to oven, where the proper word would be ra'ah, he simply sees it, no, we say, we're not even using that word. We're using the word he beat. And, and the same thing when it comes up. Good. So that's about those two. What about Yaakov and Yisrael? What's the difference between Yaakov and Yisrael? Right? Lo he beat oven be Yaakov, lo ra'a amal be Yisrael. 
So says the Malbim. Anybody? What? One is born of the vote, and one is the nation. Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, so Rosie uh, is uh, ninety five percent correct. I'm sorry, Rosie, to give you a ninety five. I know that that's gonna, I know that's gonna create angst. Yes, correct, correct. How does the Malbim understand it? So the Malbim says that when we use the term Yaakov, we're referring to the elite of the Jewish people, the leaders of the Jewish people, the, the ones who stand out among the Jewish people. Rosie, that's why you're only 95% because you said the Avot. So, right. so, 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 so Bilam is saying, right, that you know, it comes to the leaders of the Jewish people. So that's Yaakov. When it comes to the Am, that's Yisrael, right? That's Yisrael. So, so again, this is a switch. Because what would we expect to be associated with the leaders, right? We would expect, if the leaders are going to do something bad, it's not because they are of bad character traits. Why are they doing something bad? All right, they, did a, they did a bad deed. They did something wrong. Okay, right? So, lo he beat. So, Kaddish Baruch Hu doesn't contemplate that among the leaders. And when it comes to the Amcha, Right, which you know, it's much more likely for a stam person, for a regular person, to to feel, you know, to have bad character traits in addition to doing something bad. Lo ra'a amal Yisrael. A Kaddish Baruch Hu doesn't consider that at all. So the Mabim said both of these expressions are are here, and they're worded differently, but they're both conveying the same sense. They're, they're, that Hashem is deliberately not paying attention, not focusing, not on bad deeds, not on bad character traits. When it comes to the Jewish people, he lets it all go. And that's what Bilam is saying to Balak here. Or as Bilam is saying to Balak, listen, you think that because these people are, are terrible that we're going to be able to curse them now? No way. We're not going to be able to do that, right? Why are we not going to be able to do that? We can't do that because no matter what they do, God doesn't consider it to be a transgression. He doesn't consider it to be something worthy of deserting and abandoning them. It doesn't mean we're not going to get punished. You shouldn't look at this Pasuk and say, gee, that's cool. Lo he beat Avin be Yaakov. I could do whatever I want to do. No, fakir, right? Lo he beat Avin be Yaakov. God doesn't sever the relationship that he has with us because of transgression. But it doesn't mean you're not going to get punished because of transgression. Right? One of the things that we say transgression brings about is punishment. So, so we have to understand what, what, the, what Bilam is saying is that God is not going to sever his relationship with his people. So don't think, Balak, that even if this people transgresses, even if you're able to cause them to transgress, even if they transgress, that God is going to sever his relationship with them. And by the way, how is Bilam ultimately successful in bringing about uh, in, in hurting the Jewish people, indeed, by causing them to by causing them to uh, to to transgress, but he's not successful in severing their relationship with Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Okay, any questions on today? Amazing. Just, just think, when you think of Yaakov, and then you feel his individual suffering. So somehow that has more impact. But I didn't say Malbi said that. That's <laughs> Okay, everybody else is good. Fern, I didn't get a chance to welcome you. Nice to have you back in class. How are you? Vivian, who else, who else joined us? Whoever else joined us, welcome. It's nice to have you back again. It makes my Thursday morning. It actually makes my entire week. Um, so thank you all very much for being here. Have a wonderful day. Thanksgiving is here. Right, Thanksgiving is when? Next Thursday is Thanksgiving. What's your sense? Yes, no. Yes, yes. All right. You know what? I don't want. I don't want to embarrass anyone. I'm gonna send out. I'm gonna send out a poll, and you'll let me know. Uh, you'll let me know whether. Rabbi, could you share with us the class's email? Would anybody object to that? Yeah, I'm sure they would. Yeah, I should share with you everyone's email. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Does anybody mind? No. Okay. Let's do it this way. I won't share it with Sue for the next 30 minutes. 
or 15 minutes. If any of you mind, send me an email at dpolikoff at gns.org. Say, please don't share my email and I won't share it. If I don't hear from you within the next 15 minutes, I'm going to share all the emails with Sue. Do you have bipartisan monitoring of ballots? What? <laughs> the Thursday class is up to Ellen, not the rest of us. <laughs> okay, everybody. That's absolutely true, Rosie. Okay, everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you.